Hello, and uh, welcome back to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. For everyone who's uh, just uh, tuned in, my name is Navid Said. Um, here with me are uh, Professor Eric Buckers and Professor Elham Fadali. Um, nice to meet you. Um, Eric is a professor of nanomaterials and devices at the Eindhoven University of Technology uh, with a PhD in nanoelectrochemistry uh, from the University of Utrecht. Um, Eric spent more than nine years working in the industry at the Philips Research Lab. Uh, where he led a team focusing on nanowires. And in 2010, he joined TU Eindhoven, where he now runs the Center for Quantum Materials and Technology. Nice yeah, thank you. Here. Thanks. Yeah. Eric. Um, Elham is currently a guest researcher um, at Eindhoven University of Technology. She holds a bachelor's degree in electronics engineering from the American University in Cairo and a joint master's degree in uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology from KU Leuven and Chalmers University of Technology. And Elham obtained her PhD in applied physics with cum laude from TU Eindhoven in April, uh, April this year. Congratulations. Uh, now, um, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, but if you've tuned in just now, this is not just an opportunity for me, of course, uh, to ask um, our guests um, a few questions about their research and its implications, but this is also an excellent opportunity for you viewers out there um, to address your questions and comments to Eric and Elham. So uh, perhaps for more technical guidance um, and for your information, should you wish to speak with our guests directly, please use the raise your hand option on Zoom. Um, we will uh, then uh, unmute you. You will be spotlighted on the screen and you can speak. Uh, once you've addressed your question or comment, um, we will uh, mute you again. Uh, and should you have any technical difficulties or technical issues that you're facing, uh, please reach out to our uh, technical moderator uh, who will assist you. And uh, the Breakthrough Conversations uh, are being recorded and will be made available in the content library on the Falling Walls website after the Science Summit is over. So feel free to revisit uh, fallingwalls.com. Um, to check out all of the conversations uh, that have taken place. Dear Eric, dear Elham, so earlier you've spoken at the Falling Walls Conference. Um, of course, we're all quite happy that all of this is happening again in person. Um, but since maybe not everyone uh, that is viewing us right now has seen this talk, could you perhaps explain to us and the viewers uh, what your research is about? Shall I take this question? Okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. So. Um, um, if, you, if you look to uh, the electronics industry, uh, well, it, it's called electronics industry, and, and that has a reason. So uh, all the electronic components are based on silicon, which is a semiconductor. And we use, well, electronic currents to send around the information. Um, and it has been very successful. Uh, I mean, well, we all use uh, electronics like phones and, um, and, and laptops and computers. Um, it has been very successful, but now, um, the problem that we are facing is that, uh, for instance, data centers, they, they use a lot of energy. Um, I think currently it's like maybe 10% or so of the global energy uh, supply, and it will simply increase towards uh, 20, 30%. So it, it's really a lot of energy. I mean, 20% of the global energy supply, that's a lot of energy. So that, that's what we use in, um, in information technology. and. Um, well, we all know that, that we have to decrease this amount of energy that we use. And one way of doing this that had been realized already in the, in the 60s or the 70s is instead of using uh, purely electronics is to also use photonics. So to use uh, light in combination with electronics. So in, in the long term future, I think what would be the I ideal uh, chip or computer chip is partly based on, on electronic components like transistors will still be electronic, but then information is guided through, uh, uh, well, by light actually, so by photons. And in that sense, we can reduce the energy consumption uh, enormously. And okay, and now what we have added to this is, so silicon is, is the semiconductor um, on which all these, these chips are based, but silicon fundamentally cannot emit light, so it cannot work with light. Mm -hmm. And that has been realized already, well, at the beginning of this, uh, well, of the silicon industry, let's say. Uh, so people have been looking for ways to integrate photonics in, in silicon technology, but always that has been very problematic. Now what we have done is, uh, so actually in, in the 70s, uh, papers were published that predicted that if you would change the, the crystal structure of the silicon, so that is the way these atoms are stacked, uh, so it's the symmetry of the crystal, 
that we could make uh, silicon emit light. Also, there people have tried that, uh, but without lots of success, I would say. So uh, about 10 years ago, we, we started with this project, and we figured out, so um, well, I, I'm working in the field of uh, nanowires, so, so studying the, the growth mechanism of nanowires. And with these nanowires, we had a tool to change the crystal structure of materials just by the growth mechanism. And we have used this, let's say, to also change this crystal structure of, of silicon and germanium. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we started to do 10 years ago. And well, uh, two years ago, we started to see light emission from the silicon with the other crystal structure. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, and uh, since you've already mentioned devices uh, th that use these, uh, these chips or are um, influenced, um, are you working with the industry on this, or are you working with, with various companies on this as well in order to um, apply this? Yeah, so uh, at this moment, or how we started was also uh, really like a scientific question. So can we change the crystal structure of the silicon and can we have uh, light emission from it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, since a few years now, we, we are involved in a big European project in which also companies are involved. Mm -hmm. so, so IBM is, uh, is interested in this, yeah. And what's the, what's the overall goal of that European project? Is it about, uh, of course, I assume, reducing our energy consumption? Um, or is it, what is it about? Maybe you can contextualize that. Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question. So the, uh, on the long term, it's reducing the energy consumption. But that will take, uh, that will take time, serious time. So I, th I think there are some intermediate steps. And the first step is, first of all, to demonstrate that we can make a laser out of silicon. So, so that's a big step. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also pretty spectacular. I mean, if you see how people um, have been working in this field, and if you look to the expectations, um, and yeah. So, so first of all, it, it's demonstrating lasing, and then secondly, what we have to do is to demonstrate that we can integrate this material in a process which is compatible with standard silicon uh, processing, mm -hmm. such that uh, uh, factories can also work with this material. Right. Um, and, and perhaps a question uh, for you, Elham. If, uh, like I had said earlier, uh, we've got an audience here of, of uh, not just people from academia, but, but from policymaking, uh, from the industry, from the general public, how um, does your work um, impact us as an end user? Um, so uh, it's really a good question. Is it's exactly as Eric said. It, it impacts uh, us in many ways. For example, the energy consumption. We are all. Uh, we can all feel it. Like when you uh, use your uh, laptop excessively, it heats up and it uh, it uh, consumes a lot of energy. Also, like the for example during the COVID nineteen time, we're all at home streaming uh, uh, like all our Zoom calls, Teams, uh, and also Netflix downloads, YouTube, um, uh, Facebook, all these social media. It's a huge uh, uh, data traffic that mm. consumes a lot of energy, as Eric said, like n nearly 20% of the uh, global energy um, for due to the data centers. So we are impacted uh, by that. Um, it can also affect us maybe in future applications like um, uh, autonomous driving. For example, if we can realize such uh, um, beautiful material into a laser, an efficient light uh, mission source that we can use for autonomous driving, it's like radar, the working with sound waves. Uh, LiDAR is working with light waves, then you can send a signal out of a laser source, maybe out of uh, uh, made out of silicon, and then you start sensing the environment around it and then detect signals back and then you enable such technology with uh, silicon compatible uh, chips. Like you can use it in uh, uh, sensors, biosensors for the medical field, uh, maybe um, uh, to sense air quality for environmental uh, reasons, um, etc. So. It can enable many applications that we can really feel the impact, uh, the societal impact in our life. That's interesting. Is there a, um, so, so, so this is clear impact. Do you kind of, does this information or, or um, how this impact, your, how your research impacts perhaps various industries come back to you in order for you to kind of reevaluate whether you're on the right path? Um, because of course we're talking about reducing um, energy consumption. Um, are there perhaps indicators that you use to reevaluate are we on the right path um. I would say n not yet I think it, it's too early for that uh, but maybe I can add something so besides ed uh, energy reduction the other benefit of using light is that we can uh, go much faster so mm. um, currently I mean uh, our houses are connected to internet and some people have like an old let's say copper connection so just an old-fashioned wire 
and more modern houses are maybe connected to gloss fiber. So that's a, like a factor 100 increase in, in data speed. Mm -hmm. And that's the same kind of factor that we can uh, obtain on chip. So it's not only that we use less energy, but also these chips will be much and much faster. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also really appreciated by, well, well, for many applications. Absolutely, absolutely. No, that's quite interesting. Um, what, would you, what would you consider the biggest challenge that you're facing in your research? Um, and maybe not just from, let's say, a research perspective, but perhaps also from a policy perspective. Are there certain obstacles that you have to overcome in order uh, to push for more progress? I'll ask you, Ella. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I can think of a, a couple of points. So first of all, if we're talking about uh, uh, policy making or uh, like industry or so, um, we are talking about a, a very fundamental research question. It's a, at an early stage. So you need to uh, um, demonstrate a working device that can compete with the current technology such that you can start convincing the industry that it can be economic, energy efficient, faster than the, the um, current solution. Because it takes a whole industry to change the current platform where we're doing this allied based uh, uh, communication. Because it's based on other materials and not silicon right now. So you're kind of revolutionizing a whole industry uh, with sort of an economic uh, um, a model um, based on it. So I think we will take time until uh, that happens, if we can really convince them that we have a working device and much better solution than what we're having now. So crossing fingers, we reach to this point. Uh, from another perspective also, um, I think in, in the scientific community, because we're all like kind of at least uh, scientists, we're driven by curiosity. But sometimes uh, when you're tackling a problem for so long time, it becomes like, um, as we call it in the field, like a holy grail and probably it's kind of impossible to achieve it, then better take uh, another uh, faster route or um, a more uh, obvious route. But what I really liked, at least when I was doing my research in Eric's group, it's uh, basically revisiting the old questions and reviving an old horse. So we can always take alternative uh, solutions, but also can think of innovative solutions for existing uh, good materials. So it's basically being conservative either inside the scientific community or from uh, the existing industry or policy making. Right, Eric, you have to add anything to add to that? Uh, maybe I can add something. So I think Politically, I think it's, it's a critical balance between being very enthusiastic, uh, but not creating a, a too uh, big hype, let's say. I mean, there are many fields where the expectations are way too high, and I think we should avoid this because, well, I think in the end it doesn't help. So on the one side, I think we should be very optimistic and uh, enthusiastic, and um, yeah. On the other side, I think we should be realistic and, and just tell the story that it will take time. I mean, we, we have to take it step by step. The other thing which is sometimes a challenge is in, in academia. Um, so most of the work is done by PhD students and they are in the group for four years. And then, well, important people, they leave. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course they leave. Um, but then also knowledge uh, will leave. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, that's a drawback, I think, of academia. So continui continui uh, how do you call this? Continuity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Th that's, that's a big challenge. I mean, that going. That's almost a universal challenge. Um, but how do you deal with that? How, how do you manage um, to, 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 to bridge a gap that can happen like that, especially in, in research where it's so important to have that continuity? Yeah, so what we try to do with funding is to have overlap between, uh, between the students, such that they have like uh, half of their uh, period with us uh, uh, overlapping with the previous uh, student. And if I may add to it, also like all the efforts uh, happening now in universities and also in Eindhoven, uh, with all these data management plans and the open access that you upload data uh, to be available to the public, but also to our uh, colleagues such that someone uh, else can access it, access it freely and can build on your work with all the transparency that you're basically putting everything after you've finished it. So, mm -hmm. and I think this is also very important for continuation of our work inside the group, but also inside the whole community uh, worldwide. Interesting. And um, perhaps um, I'll ask you both the same question that I'd asked Claire previously. Um, how did you get into the field? What, what sparked your interest? Because I think it's always interesting, especially for uh, you know the emerging talents that we also include in in, in falling walls. Uh, to, to and even let's say a step before that, uh, you know, students that may come out of uh, school uh, want to know. You know, how do you get into 
this subject? How do you develop such passion uh, for your research? Okay. Maybe I'll start. start. <laughs> so uh, I must say, actually, uh, by training or uh, my education before uh, graduate studies, uh, I'm actually not a physicist or a material scientist. <laughs> I'm an electronics engineer. Uh, but since I was young, um, I was very curious to know how things work. I really um, thinking what's the concept behind something, what's inside it, such that it's making it uh, working in a unique way. Uh, and then I, I was really passionate to physics and mathematics. So, okay, I chose obviously engineering, but when I studied engineering during my bachelor's studies, I felt, no, I'm still uh, working with a black box. It's quite high level. I want to dive deeper into the, the really the basic or the fundamental concept. So I, I started uh, to take different courses during my undergraduate studies or shift a bit more towards the physics of electronic devices instead mm. of uh, the behavior of electronic devices from a high level. And then I was really fascinated how you can manipulate, uh, like for example, materials or uh, tiny components and it changed the whole behavior or a property, uh, uh, properties of a whole circuit. And then uh, I chose to uh, go in this uh, path of the um, nanoscience, nanotechnology, and back then I was still bridging between electronics and uh, um, nanophysics. And uh, I must say that actually during my master's, uh, I had a course and Eric was a guest lecturer in it. And he was talking about uh, his field of research in nanowires and, um, and I was really fascinated. And back then I was still uh, during the first year of my master's. And back then I already emailed him that I'm actually uh, really interested to join his group after I finish uh, my master's. So yeah, this is how we found each other. <laughs> Always good to be proactive. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Eric, what about you? Yeah, so I had a, ver a very lucky situation. So directly after my PhD, I started to work at Philips Research. Um, and just before I started there, there was a complaint by other researchers that um, the work that they typically were doing was had shifted too much towards application. So they wanted to start uh, new fundamental research at that company. So the day I started, they had organized a workshop where they uh, uh, opened calls for five new initiatives. Mm. Uh, so they also invited me to come there and to give a talk on what I would like uh, I, I would like to do there and what what would be interesting for the company. And exactly at that time, there were very interesting papers published on on nanowires. So uh, I presented nanowires, and uh, the management that they liked it and they gave me the freedom, so I could just start with working on nanowires within the company, doing very fundamental research. And mm. that's great. Yeah. Um, we've got a question uh, from the audience, so please, floor is yours. Um, we have a question from the chat. Oh, I see the person now raising hand, so let him speak, maybe. I'm sorry. No worries, thank you. You're free to ask your question if you like. Okay, maybe we'll we'll get back to that. Um, but or it's possible to listen, me? Uh, yeah, now we can hear you. Well, the, the question was for both. I was wondering if it will be difficult, or what will be the level of difficulty to to transfer this kind of technology of hexagonal silicon from the lab to to the CMOS process or the the manufacturing process of a uh, chips and silicon devices, because probably, apart from, from light, you will have to combine with uh, the electronic silicon. So probably you have to make something hybrid, and it probably will increase difficulties to, to make the integration. Did you try with the companies or, or by yourself in the lab about this possibility? And that, that's an excellent uh, question, and uh, I think that that's a very big challenge, uh, to be honest. Um, so at this moment, we, we use nanowires, which are grown from a gold catalyst. Uh, so gold is for sure not compatible with, with uh, silicon technology. And then now we first grow a gallium arsenide wire. Uh, so it, it, uh, till this moment, it, it's very academic. And one of the big challenges that we put for ourselves is to come up with processes which are compatible with, with what is called CMOS. Um, uh, so that will be addressed within our project, but then I think realistically it will take may maybe 10 years before, let's say, so even if we have realized a laser and we can make functional devices like lasers electronically pumped, 
we can maybe integrate it in, in photonic circuits at the academic level before it will be integrated in, uh, let's say, a serious uh, silicon industry, it will take many, many years. At least, uh, at least that is my experience. I mean, if you look to the industry, uh, they are quite conservative. Um, so they know that they have to integrate new materials, uh, but also they are very strict in, in introducing new elements in their, um, in their factories. Uh, what I hope actually is that we can demonstrate a few of these steps and that then uh, one or maybe a few of these big companies will take over and they will put their engineers on top of this and I think they are able to to scale it up and introduce this in, in the factory. I think we are not uh, equipped, I think, uh, well enough to do this. Yeah, if I may add to it uh, uh, a tiny point, is that, um, as Eric said, we are still at the very beginning of uh, the, the project. It's still very fundamental, so I think the main focus right now is to uh, probe the intrinsic property of such a new material, because mm. it didn't exist before, so we basically knew nothing about it except for uh, uh, theoretical calculations. So now we are comparing theoretical calculations with the experimental uh, results we are having. We are uh, extracting uh, electronic and optical properties such that we can can already start uh, establishing that further. So now it's still fundamental, and hopefully when we master that, we know more about the, this new material, then we can hopefully drive the technology if it is promising. And we have to be uh, open, and as Eric said, and realistic. If it works, great, we push it forward. If not, then we have to be realistic with ourselves and look for alternatives. And this is the beauty of, of science. Yeah, and, and, and when you say, for example, you might not be equipped to kind of push for that transformation, what do you think you need in order to be able to do that? Okay, but I think if you, if you look to the to a silicon factory, these are like huge factories, which are even completely robotized uh, nowadays. Mm. And, and we have a small, let's say, academic uh, clean room uh, at our university. So you need different uh, pieces of equipment, you need different um, engineers, I think, to do this. So I, I think we are good in demonstrating the first steps and the viability of this technology. Mm. But then I think it should be taken over. Mm. OK. Well, great. Um, Elham, Eric, thank you so much. I think this uh, concludes our interview. Um, it was an absolute pleasure speaking to you both, learning about your research, why you got into the research as well. Um, we will be back in a few minutes with more um, Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. Please stay tuned, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.